Good evening, I'd like to call this meeting of the Sterling Heights City Council to order. As we've been doing these last several months without objection, I would ask that we suspend the rules to provide this council meeting be held via video and teleconference in accordance with Governor Whitmer's executive order 2020-75 and that participation of no less than four council members on this conference constitutes a quorum pursuant to the Open Meetings Act. Additionally, the public hearing on tonight's budget adoption will be provided via Zoom teleconference at the following telephone number, 929-205-6099. When prompted, residents should enter the following meeting number, 44119975 and press pound. You do not need to use a passcode. As with our prior Zoom, Teleconference meetings, I would ask public comment germane to any other agenda item or city business be provided via Zoom telephone conference uh, during communications from citizens at the same telephone number at the end of the meeting. Procedurally, in order to facilitate an orderly meeting by video and teleconferencing, I ask that if any of my colleagues want the floor to make or second a motion, please unmute yourself and ask for the floor. This will allow me to identify you. In case two council members speak over one another, I will make the final call. Also, council members are reminded to have their devices on mute when not talking and mute any other devices, including cell phones and computers and laptops that you may have in close range uh, when you are on the uh, when you are unmuted and refrain from watching the meeting online due to the slight broadcast delay. All votes of the city council tonight will be by roll call vote conducted by the city clerk. Is there any objection to proceeding in the manner that I've outlined just now? Seeing none, I will uh, recite the Pledge of Allegiance on behalf of the city council so it can be heard clearly. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Risco, will you please proceed by reciting our invocation? Dear God, please bless our elected officials. Grant them courage and wisdom to do what is right for all citizens. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ms. Risca. Can we please have the roll call? Mayor Taylor? Participating. Mrs. Sarowski? Participating. Mrs. Koski? Participating. Mr. Radke? Participating. Mrs. Schmidt? Participating. Mr. Yanis? Participating. And Mrs. Yarko? Participating. Thank you, Ms. Riska. Council, we need approval of tonight's agenda. Mr. Mayor? Mrs. Koski may pr proceed. Move to approve the agenda. Is there a second? Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Zarco, do you second? Yes, I do. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Ms. Riska, can we please have a roll call vote? Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mr. Yanez? Yes. Mrs. Yarko? Yes. Mrs. Koski? Yes. Mr. Radke? Yes. Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. Mrs. Sarasky. Yes. Motion carries 7-0. Next item on our agenda tonight is a report from our city manager, Mark Vanderpool, Mr. Vanderpool. Thank you very much, Mayor. Let me begin by uh, providing an update on our reopening. As everyone knows, City Hall and our most of our city facilities are open now. Uh, last week at City Hall, we had approximately 100 visitors. Uh, we expect that uh, that number will be increasing uh, weekly as, as we go on. Uh, but what I wanted to do is take just a minute or two and highlight uh, some of the noteworthy metrics of, of when we were um, closed, if you will. Our city facilities were closed for almost a three month period of time, uh, but certainly business uh, was not closed for the city. So if I can uh, draw attention to the uh, screen. Let me, let me get you connected. Uh, 
So let me breeze through this. So over the three month period of time in which the facilities were closed, we still processed over 7,000 pieces of mail. We had almost 2,500 voter registration transactions. And in community relations, uh, the statistics are quite impressive. Uh, we had a 30% increase in visits to our website. We had 600 new subscribers to our city news digital newsletter. Uh, so that brings us up over uh, 10,000 individuals now. We had a 30% increase in reach on our Facebook posts, nearly 1,000 new Facebook followers and 250 new Twitter followers during the three-month period. We process 550 C clicks fix inquiries, resolving roughly 90% of them within 48 hours of receiving them. With respect to uh, finance, a uh, water billing processed over 12,000 online water bill payments. Accounts payable processed approximately 2,200 invoices. Assessing process almost 1,000 new owner transfer deeds and almost 2,000 general inquiries. Treasury addressed approximately 650 title agency requests via email. And in Parks and Rec, I was really pleased to see this number. Over 4,000 phone calls were made to check on senior residents. So we not only established a senior assistance line that proved, that proved to be very effective, but we also made personal calls uh, to make sure that our seniors were, were okay in getting the uh, services they needed and able to grocery shop and so on. We had over a thousand online registration for various virtual programs in parks and recreation. And uh, we also ha uh, had a number of um, RFPs that were processed electronically. Those are requests for proposals. Uh, in addition, contractors were able to submit various plans for construction projects and so on electronically. So that worked very well throughout the process. And uh, in building our online permit activity increased by uh, over 20% over last year, just during this period of time. And as you know, we rolled out our new virtual inspection program. We're still doing some of those in addition to now in-person inspections but we had over uh, 15 virtual inspections. And most impressively, the library uh, had over 22,000 digital resources checked out over the three month period and 64 virtual programs were held with over 33 uh, participants uh, viewing or participating uh, uh, virtually. So, uh, I wanted to point this out because while we were closed and we're, you know, back to some normalcy, it is uh, um, the silver lining in the dark clouds is that we're able to create uh, new methods to conduct business and new ways to reach residents uh, during times of an emergency. So I am really excited to talk about this uh, next item, our city clerk, Melanie Riska has been named City Clerk of the Year by the Michigan Association of Municipal Clerks. And so this is a, quite an honor. Uh, Melanie was chosen over city clerks all across the state of Michigan. Throughout her career, Melanie has been a champion for clerks throughout the state. She often mentors new clerks and encourages association membership and education. She currently serves on the Association Board of Directors as Chair of Education and Vice President of the Macomb County Clerks Association. And Melanie is a former president of the Association of Wayne County Clerks. And I can just uh, speak personally from our organization's vantage point. She has been an invaluable asset to our organization. Uh, she is a really strong leader and enjoys a great reputation and rapport with all of her uh, colleagues at the director level in Sterling Heights. And I could not be more proud to uh, announce this award this evening. We are really lucky to have uh, Melanie Riska with us. So congratulations to Melanie and a job well done. And 
Uh, I want to uh, now take a minute to introduce our finance and budget director, Jennifer Varney, who's going to talk about a program on our consent agenda this evening. Um, now, the, the next two presentations are an illustration of, of all that we're doing to, number one, uh, help residents uh, throughout Sterling Heights as, as they may be having a, a individual financial uh, struggles through this pandemic and, and during a period of layoffs and so on. Um, but uh, in addition, we're doing all that we can to help our businesses uh, restart and, and uh, try to get back to some normalcy in, in that area as well. So I'm pleased to introduce Jennifer Varney, who's gonna talk about a new program that's being considered by city council this evening. Thank you, Mark, uh, Mr. Vanderpool. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Vanderpool, Mr. Kashubsky, and members of council. I'm happy to be here tonight to talk to you. I'm gonna get this up here. There we go. Um, you have a resolution before you this evening to opt in to the expansion of the Macomb County Keep Macomb Your Home program. This program will help low-income residents of Sterling Heights avoid foreclosure on their owner-occupied homes. This is a county-run program for residents that have had their property taxes turned over delinquent to Macomb County. The goal is to prevent foreclosures on homes that are occupied by their owners. It is targeted toward low-income residents and there are four different tiers of relief. Tier one is known as the pay as you stay agreement or pays program. It is available only to taxpayers who have already applied for and received a hardship exemption through the city. Qualified applicants may be eligible for a reduction in taxes owed and interest, penalties, service charges, and fees may also be canceled. Taxpayers will have up to three years to pay off their balance interest-free. Tier two is a tax foreclosure avoidance agreement. This is available to taxpayers with an income at or below federal poverty standards, but who do not have a hardship exemption through the city. As with all the programs, the home must be subject to a principal residence exemption meaning that it, the home is owned and occupied by the taxpayer. And there are also additional asset limitations. Qualified taxpayers can receive a reduced interest rate of 6% annually. The regular rate is 18% and up to three years to pay. The third tier is a delinquent property tax installment plan. This is available to taxpayers with income levels at or below two times the poverty level. Again, the property must be owner occupied and there are asset limitations. These taxpayers receive a reduced interest rate of 12% per year, but must be pay in full by December 31st of the foreclosure judgment year. That's about nine additional months to pay. The last year tier, tier four, is available to taxpayers with an income level at three times the poverty level or another demonstrated hardship. This tier offers an extension to pay at the normal interest rate of 18%. In order for Sterling Heights taxpayers to benefit from the pay as you stay program, the city council must adopt a resolution opting in, which we have done tonight. Once again, this is a county administered program that will benefit low income taxpayers in Sterling Heights with the ultimate goal of keeping people in their homes. Thank you. So, Mayor and Council, this item again is on the consent agenda uh, this evening and the city, if the consent agenda is approved, then we'll be opting into this uh, countywide program. And now, as I mentioned, we want to focus our attention on uh, what we're doing to uh, help our businesses along and get through this uh, painful period of time that they've had to suffer through. We're really excited to talk about this next program. And I'm pleased to introduce our city planner, Chris McCloud. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vanderpool, uh, Mr. Mayor, City Council. Uh, yeah, so tonight we would like to roll out our new program officially entitled Sterling Heights Inside Out. Uh, so as the name implies, we're allowing businesses uh, even more so than we have in the past uh, for the, this, this upcoming year to turn their businesses from the inside to the outside in an attempt to make sure that we're compliant 
with all social distancing guidelines and any executive orders that the governor has in place at this particular time. So you'll start seeing flyers and, and informational uh, packets such as this that say inside out. Our idea is to relax our review process for those business owners. They've already gone through a numerous different uh, application processes for either financial aid, uh, for, for keeping their employees in through, or, or having to file for unemployment and those types of things. We're expediting approvals and we're reducing the business application fee to basically zero at this point. Uh, through the end of the uh, through the end of the fall, and with the option of extending through the year if your business is compliant with all the requirements as part of the program. So again, you'll start to see these as you as you start to see the media onslaught as we have through media relations. Uh, we're going to do full press release, radio interviews, social media blasts, obviously announcement from the Inside Out program across all platforms. Uh, we've uh, adopted the hashtag of Sterling Heights Inside Out. Uh, and hopefully people will be using that while enjoying their outdoor services uh, as part of this program. Um, and then feature businesses that tag us, we can share their posts and things amongst the city's websites as well and the social media platforms. Uh, the city has already developed uh, an inside out webpage uh, that comes off of the community development webpage itself. And then banner will be on the homepage as well. So that way it's easily accessible. Uh, as part of any of these uh, abilities to interact with social media, or the media relations and SHTV will also be out and about, um, but we'll be looking for short snippets of video that, and, and picture taking that we can uh, help promote the program itself. And then obviously we have a number of contacts through our current uh, databases as well as we'll be working with the chamber uh, to make sure that eblasts go out to get to our businesses as, as much as we possibly can. Uh, and as part of that, as I said, cross promotion will be key in this, uh, going to the Chaldean chamber, going to the Sterling Heights chamber, events like patios and pints. So as part of this, we wanna make sure that we have a full blown uh, media presence in terms of getting this event out. So that way, again, we're helping out our businesses as much as possible. So we created a specific, specific application that is taken in by the planning department. As part of this, uh, we basically committed ourselves to a three day turnaround period. Um, most of these applications, uh, as long as they're relatively straightforward and we anticipate that most of them will be, um, will be reviewed by the planning department, building department, and fire department. Um, so we'll be busy, at least our hope is, is that we'll be busy. Uh, so this is an application fill, fillable online um, and then submitted, everything is ideally submitted um, digitally. Uh, so that way, again, trying to make things as easy as we possibly can uh, on the business owners coming forward. This is a, kind of a self-evaluation checklist um, that we have that we've created because obviously business owners don't do this every day. You know, they're obviously already trying to figure out, you know, just how to stay alive at this point. Um, we're trying to help them every way we can. These, this is basically the list of things that we want to make sure that they're thinking of uh, as they kind of proceed down this road and making sure that they have the proper permits. Did they check with the Liquor Control Commission in terms of what their liquor license allows? Um, making sure that the planning, building, and, and, and fire departments are all on on board with what's going on, making sure that they have proper uh, securement of the area at night and at times it's not used and so forth. So again, the idea is that this checklist um, is a kind of a one-stop shop, if you will, in terms of people being able to say, okay, what do I need? You know, what do I need to make this work? And it's all right there in front of them, hopefully, you know, that they won't have to go anyplace else. Uh, the review process, hopefully it's as simple. Fill out the application, provide the information you're requesting. We're even taking less information than we normally would um, from the standpoint of, you know, that we're sketches, photos of what you're trying to do, if even if you mock it up, you know, in your parking lot or in your sidewalk, um, you know, that way they, they don't necessarily have to spend a lot of money on drawings to be provided. If, like I said, if they do it or they just simply do a preliminary layout and take a picture, get that information to us, um, and then we'll help them through the process the rest of the way. Again, our review process timeframe is hopefully three days. And if everything is in place, uh, hopefully within three days, you're, you're up and running your outside event. I do want to note that as part of this, you know, and we'll look at some pictures here in one second, but as part of this, the hope is, is that this can be not only uh, simply a sidewalk uh, type of event, but also as long as the parking is correct for the site, or at least within reason for the site, uh, that some of these events can even spill within uh, the parking lots themselves. Again, that, with the idea of 
trying to provide as much flexibility and as much relief as we possibly can you know, for business owners. So see, these are some of the, the ideas and some of the concepts you know, that are happening in other communities of, of what we could anticipate. Again, some of these events are going right on within the parking lot. Um, some of them are uh, just expansions of patio areas that exist now. And obviously anything that goes on has to be fully compliant with those executive orders as well. We fully anticipate that. So, so again, some additional examples of how people are getting creative and try to provide you know, ideas of, of taking up their parking spaces, taking up some of their sidewalk spaces and allowing for them to fully function uh, as a business owner in the coming months. And again, this program would run through basically the end of September. Um, if your use and the weather is good, um, allows you to, you can go beyond that um, with automatic renewals till the true end of the year. Uh, but again, obviously that's all weather dependent and you know, in terms of making sure that your use is complied with all the requirements of the executive order, uh, as well as the guideline checklist. Um, so again, we're really excited for this. Hopefully we'll be very busy with this. I, I would anticipate we will. We've already had a couple of people um, come to the planning department um, in the last couple of days, uh, inquiring about what they can be doing as part of this. And so we've already kind of sent this out in draft form, so to speak, uh, to those uh, folks. And we should be getting those applications back soon. So even before tonight, this is already kind of, the wheels are already kind of set in motion. So I think it's gonna be a very good thing for business owners. So with that, I'd like to thank council for the time. Um, and if there are any questions, I'll be more than glad to try to answer them. And Mayor, I just wanted to, uh thank Mr. McLeod and, and the team that has worked really hard on this, including the city attorney's office and our building official, uh, Mike Byzenko, and uh, so many others, and certainly uh, our community relations director and, and her team. Uh, this has been under review and under design for, oh, at least the last month or so, maybe a couple of months by now, we've kind of lost track, but it's another example of the innovativeness that's coming out of the organization and ingenuity. And so uh, there are some, as I mentioned earlier, silver linings in these uh, dark clouds. Uh, so look forward to much more information. While we focused on restaurants and, and outdoor eateries, you know, it could also be outdoor retail uh, sales on the sidewalk and, and other commercial uses that could uh, extend outside. So it, it's not just uh, eating establishments. So I'd like to continue on and devote the uh, next section of my report uh, to the uh, very, very difficult uh, issue that is being experienced uh, nationwide uh, with, um, um, uh, as evident by the protesting that's going on uh, throughout communities and, and in response to the uh, racial injustices that unfortunately are being experienced in, in the United States. And certainly uh, Sterling Heights is, is not immune from uh, the, the challenge at hand. So I wanted to talk uh, first, starting out um, about what we are doing in the city of Sterling Heights to foster inclusiveness and to foster diversity, all centered around our visioning statement. And then our police chief is gonna talk uh, uh, some about exactly what we're doing uh, in the police department with respect to inclusiveness and best practices and so on. And then I'm gonna conclude by announcing a, a really new and exciting organization that we plan on uh, collaborating and partnering with uh, moving forward. So let me begin by once again, drawing your attention to the screen. Uh, actually, I'm afraid you don't have any choice but to look at the screen. Uh, so, um, let me start. Okay, so uh, we, we have been talking about our Visioning 2030 uh, statement and guiding principles for a number of years now. Uh, we, we spent a couple of years with a great collaboration in the community and engagement from businesses and residents and city leaders and, and others developing our uh, visioning 2030 plan, which includes this vision statement and seven other guiding principles. I'm not going to get into the guiding principles because this is the most important uh, statement. And so I want to read it. Uh, Sterling Heights will be a vibrant, inclusive community for residents and businesses that is safe, active, progressive, and distinctive. 
Sterling Heights a bold vision for an exceptional, exceptional quality of life. And I wanna go back to the first line, the third word in inclusiveness. Uh, that's what we're gonna be focusing on in this presentation. So let's take a look at uh, uh, first our foreign born population in Sterling Heights. And, and this data is a couple years old now, uh, but 25% of our foreign born population, over 32,000 uh, residents are foreign born. Of our population, 25% is foreign born. That is a significant number. That, that is progress that has been made over the last uh, uh, 20 years under, under the spirit of inclusiveness. And we expect that that number, you know, when we get new data and information from the 2020 census, that that number is gonna be uh, much higher. The city of Sterling Heights was one of the first cities in Southeastern Michigan to join the uh, welcoming uh, cities movement uh, to really uh, uh, buy in uh, formally speaking, uh, to the principles uh, that make a community a welcoming city. Uh, since we have joined, there are other cities that have now joined too, including Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo, uh, Clinton Township, and, and others on the list here. And so the whole idea here is to foster diversity, inclusiveness, and to be a welcoming community and, and foster equality and equity for, for all residents. And uh, these are um, individuals, members from our important, important ethnic advisory uh, committee. That's Mark, Mr. Vanderpool, if I could interject quickly, I, I don't know if, if it's showing up on anybody else's, but I don't believe the slides are cycling through. Oh. So on, on our screen, good. it's frozen on the vision statement. Oh, I'm so sorry, and I don't know how to. Let me get out of this real quick, if you don't mind. Well, why don't you try to? And I'm going to come it. back into it. Okay. And let's see if that uh, works. Is that working now? Unfortunately, not. It's still oh. stuck on the vision statement. Uh, Steve Dion, is there anything you can do to help me with that? All right, one moment. You're not showing this screen. It's all right, bear with us here. This is an important presentation, so we want to make sure that we, we are getting it right. Uh, don't leave. I want to back up a slide too, just to show it off. Okay, now are you, do you see it? Yeah, we see the welcoming community slide. Why don't you try to cycle through and see if. All right. All right, let me go back to where I was. Okay, so did you see this slide? Okay, so this is where I mentioned our foreign born population. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, Mark, it's, it's still stuck. Oh, geez, that's horrible. Okay, well, let me pause for one moment. As I said, folks, I, I appreciate your patience here bearing with us. We, we have put a considerable amount of time and energy into uh, creating programs that will uh, highlight Can the inclusion one? and inclusive efforts that we've made thus far, but we know that there are a lot of steps that we have to take as a community. Uh, we're committed to that and uh, we're, we're hopeful that we can highlight those efforts tonight. Uh, but as with uh, everything these past few months, what you expect to happen doesn't necessarily happen and uh, despite your best effort. So uh, let's give it another try. Are you, you think you were, we might be up and running here, Mr. Vanderpool? Okay, is that any better? Can you see so the welcoming cities? 
we, what we see right now is the local foreign born population slide, slide number 10. The problem is whatever slide you put on the screen is freezing up. stuck there. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just walk through this and then we'll get to the uh, chief's presentation and see if that goes a little smoother. So what I will me... say is that uh, this is this happened during your first presentation as well. And then when um, Mrs. Varney did the uh, the tax program, the slides seemed to work from her computer. Okay, uh, so, so maybe I can so see what you can do. Course. Okay, so let me uh, why don't I do this? Let me introduce the uh, police chief. And he's gonna talk about the diversity efforts that we have going on in the police department. And if I can get reconnected, I'll follow up with my version, my part. But so chief, can you go now? Are you able to do that? Uh, yes, let me make sure mine is up and running. And are you guys seeing a full screen? We got a full screen chief. So and then as scrolling yeah. works. Yeah, All right, we're up and running. Working. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Vanderpool. Thank you, Mr. Vanderpool, Mayor Taylor, members of council. Um, yes, it is a, uh, a very difficult time um, in law enforcement across the United States. And uh, I thought it was a very appropriate time to talk about what we've been doing at the police department to make sure that we are a diverse workforce, uh, number one, and also outreach programming. It really goes hand in hand. And over the last week, I've met with multiple community leaders asking about our diversity within the police department and asking specifically, are you recruiting minorities? Uh, this question coming up and up and up. And the answer is yes, we've done quite a bit of work with that and it's very important. Um, again, this is why it's important with policing, communities are stronger. Um, when ethnic and foreign born populations feel represented, uh, it legitimizes your police department and diverse law enforcement candidates bring with them an entirely different narrative uh, to police work. And whether that's uh, I'm talking Chaldean, Albanian, female, male, African-American, everyone comes with a, a basket full of life experiences and a police department, any workforce is uh, um, a little bit more complete when you have a diverse uh, uh, work population. Um, 1970 uh, happens to be the year I was born um, in Sterling Heights. So Sterling Heights in 1970 uh, was 95, almost 96% white with 61,000 residents. Uh, 2010, our last census, uh, census we had 83% white uh, population with almost 130,000 residents. So the city um, is changing and with this, this coming up, this 2020 census, it's going to uh, increase and change even more. We know that and we're preparing for that change to make sure that we're representing everybody that lives in Sterling Heights. Um, a little bit of history and diversity in policing. Um, the riots in Detroit in 1967, Ferguson in 2014. Um, there was a multitude of reasons uh, for the, the rioting and the protesting, but a large part of it, uh, if you read the history books, was a feeling of uh, over-policing and policing by members of the public that don't live there or represent their race. Um, again, in Detroit, uh, the workforce in 1967, there was 93% white officers policing a 30% black population. In Ferguson in 2014, even worse, 94% uh, white officers policing a population that was 70% black. And um, this came up over and over again in some of the federal reports about diversity in those workforces would have definitely helped um, try to stem some of the problems and some of the relationships in those communities. Now, here we are, 2020, Sterling Heights, um, and nothing's, uh, we, here we are talking about the same topics again, uh, decades later, about equality, uh, racial justice, and uh, people wanting to be heard. And this was the protest in M59. We, we believe there was well over 4,000 people that attended this protest march. And this was white, black, young, old, everyone represented here at this peaceful march, not a single arrest, not a single police incident. Um, and it tells you that people want change. Uh, and this was just last week, Thursday, um, we had a student from Shoyance High School, um, Malcolm Charles organized a uh, protest march uh, from the library there, gave a excellent speech. And um, a lot of students from Shoyance High School and teenagers from around Sterling Heights joined in that uh, protest and that march, again, wanting their voices to be heard. This is the current breakdown of Sterling Heights. We have 152 sworn officers. 92% uh, are white. We have 9% female. Um, we've hired three of those in the last five years. 
Uh, we're 3%, uh, we have 3% African-American officers. Uh, again, three of the four that we have uh, hired in the last five years. But the last census, Sterling Heights, just to note this, we were 5% African-American population. So we're making progress in that and we're continuing to do work to uh, increase uh, African-Americans uh, within the Sterling Heights Police Department. Chaldean Americans, um, we have a large population of Chaldean here in Sterling Heights. Uh, we've hired, we have three Arabic officers, two of them hired in the last five years. So we're definitely making progress. We've done so many outreach programs with the Chaldean Community Foundation. Um, Asian officers, uh, we have two, we hired one last five years. Albanian, which is another big ethnic population here in Sterling Heights. Um, we have two and both of those were hired in the last five years. And um, one Hispanic officer, again, hired in the last five years. So there is progress um, and we are moving forward every single year and trying to be as diverse as possible. Uh, we have a lot of programs that we've been doing that with. My Bright Future, we have officers that volunteer to be mentors for uh, kids in high school that want to think about law enforcement as a career, they're assigned a mentor and these law enforcement officers, several of them work for Sterling Heights, work with them, tell them about the academy, how to get through their training to become a certified law enforcement officer. And uh, we have career fairs at all three of our local high schools that we send officers to. Um, and our police academy recruitment trips, we have uh, recruitment officers that travel literally across the entire state, all the way to the west side of the state. And we spend money for this. We put these officers up at hotels. We send them out to academies because it's important. Because if you're not selling the Sterling Heights brand, people don't know about you and people won't apply. And we've been doing that. Uh, here's one of our big recruitment nights at the Chaldean Community Foundation. Um, again, we invited the FBI to come attend this one. So I thought it was important to bring the federal government in, Michigan State Police and ourselves, uh, just so if any um, anybody in the our community wanted to think about a federal law enforcement job. They were there. Michigan State Police was there. We were there. Again, um, trying to get as diverse a candidate pool as possible. Officer Akeem doing some of the presentations there. This is our Smart Moves program. Again, you might not think of it, diversity or outreach, but it absolutely is. A law enforcement officer at this, this is, these are sixth graders here talking about you know, the rights and wrongs of you know, drugs and violence, but more importantly, trying to be a role model in that classroom. And maybe one of these kids in this classroom thinks to themselves, wow, that, that police officer was a really, really nice guy. I wanna be a police officer when I grow up. I mean, it's never too early to start thinking about career paths and that's, that's another reason they're in the classroom. Um, our clergy forum, which we've all attended, our quarterly clergy forum, trying to keep those open ties up with our diverse houses of worship. Uh, Channel 4 locally featured Sterling Heights and some of the diversity and outreach efforts that we've been doing. Um, I sit on the advisory board for two police academies, the Macomb Community College Police Academy and Ferris States Police Academy. Um, big advocate for Macomb Community College going with a third or a nighttime police academy, and that way we could have a, um, a little bit more of a diverse candidate attending the police academy, maybe a little bit older, someone that can't quit their daytime job, they could attend the academy at night. They ran it for the first time last year, and I'm proud to say the college is going to be back again this August, running it for the second time. So I give a, a lot of credit to the college, um, and they didn't really make too much money on the first session, and uh, but they're doing it because it's the right thing to do. Um, again, some other issues about hiring. Uh, very important to find, make sure you have the right people on your interview panel. Um, who do you send out to do your recruiting? Um, be involved in your schools and your police academy, selling your brand everywhere. And again, planting seeds. Again, everything doesn't work, but if you do nothing, nothing will work. That's for certain. But a lot of effort has to go on to make sure people are applying to Sterling Heights. And more importantly, um, the CEO of your police department, in this case, it's me, you have to believe in the mission and put uh, resources behind it. Um, outreach programs, diversity outreach programs that we've had recently, we're doing our accreditation process through the Michigan Law Enforcement Accreditation Program, MLEAP, and uh, we're making significant strides in that. We have hundreds of policies and procedures to go through, uh, and actually it's a excellent time to do that with the national narrative about changing some law enforcement procedures, use of force procedures, um, simple things uh, like banning chokeholds and um, reporting officers that do bad things. Um, all of these things are gonna be addressed in our use of force policies. A lot of them already are, but it's a great time to be going through this process. Our community outreach and resident engagement, our core officers, they're out there every single day solving problems between neighbors that aren't getting along and doing community events. Um, I'm happy to also announce that uh, we already have implicit bias and de-escalation training set up. We're gonna be running that all through July and August. We have six dates, 
All 152 members are going to be trained in implicit bias and de-escalation strategies, um, which will be done by the end of summer. Um, and on a personal note, I'm a member of the uh, Advocates and Leaders for Police and Community Trust. It's called ALPAC. Uh, and that's a group of uh, chiefs of police and community activists. We meet every single month and we talk about what's right and wrong in policing. Um, just our last call on Friday, we had 100 people on the line and representatives from every single community group in Metro Detroit with some really good open dialogue. Um, it was actually an excellent meeting. And just recently, Sterling Heights appointed two department members as LGBTQ liaisons. It's the first time we've ever had that at the police department. Um, body cameras. Currently, we have cameras in every single car, microphones in every single officer. But we are reviewing body cameras uh, for implementation and getting that project up and running. Um, we've talked about it for years, but I think now is the time. Transparency is being demanded. And I don't see any reason to wait any longer. So we're trying to get some the logistics down, the, the cost down, and hopefully rolling out that program here in the coming months. Um, clergy forum engagement, which I've talked about before. Our Citizens Police Academy, another great outreach program, telling our residents what we do, showing them our police department, and allowing that two-way dialogue. We hold two, two academies a year. The Smart Moves program, again, in all 19 elementary schools in our city. And what I'm really proud of is our um, innovative drug rehabilitation and recovery programs. In the state of Michigan, um, we lead in rehabilitation and drug programs with our Sterling Heights Drug-Free Coalition, which we started uh, completely on our, our own here in Sterling Heights. It's now a nonprofit with many, many members. They've done dozens of outreach programs, our Hope Not Handcuffs program. Um, and just recently, one of the first in the state, a pilot program called the Quick Response Team, where officers make house calls to people who overdosed on drugs uh, within 72 hours. And we have a nurse and a caseworker with us um, and we try to get them into treatment that day. And I'm proud to say we started that program in January, if you remember the press uh, kickoff that we had. And right before, unfortunately, we had to shut down because of COVID. But uh, in the short two months or eight weeks that we had that program up and running, um, we had a 72% success rate. 72% of people agreed for help and treatment and went in that day. So really tremendous results. I'm, I'm very proud of all the officers who participated in that program. Um, with that, again, going back to our visioning statement, a vibrant, inclusive community and re for residents and business that is safe, active, progressive. And again, as the same manager said, inclusive community. I sat on this 2030 uh, visioning committee, and I remember picking every single one of these words and every single one of these words means something. And that inclusivity word definitely means something. And that's the end of my report. Okay, thank you, Mayor. We have uh, the problem on my end corrected. Uh, so let me circle back. All right, you should all be able to see this now. Uh, so this was a slide we left off at. So again, our foreign born population is represented in this slide. So I won't uh, repeat but uh, so this is our ethnic advisory uh, committee members who work very hard in our welcoming uh, Michigan uh, endeavor and also uh, sowing the seeds all the time for greater diversity and inclusiveness uh, uh, throughout the city. Uh, last year, we had an event, uh, City Hall Welcomes All at our uh, Velocity Center uh, that was well attended. Again, the idea is to uh, uh, share with residents and, and all individuals of diverse backgrounds of all the city programming we have going on and all that we're doing in the spirit of diversity. And as you all well know, uh, every year at uh, Sterling Fest, we have the naturalization uh, ceremony uh, that is incredibly popular. And uh, you can see the very uh, diverse uh, group of individuals here, a vast majority of which are uh, persons of color. And uh, this is um, uh, something that we've really been uh, proud to host uh, every year. Certainly our cultural exchange program, uh, man, thousands of residents attend our cultural exchange program, celebrating the different, so many different nationalities in the city and, and uh, cultures. It's super exciting and uh, it seems to be growing uh, more and more every year. And our diversity awards dinner, uh, you, this, this too is a very popular program and showcases uh, the wonderful diversity that we celebrate in Sterling Heights. Uh, uh, so 
uh, this too is a program that's grown in popularity and we're very proud of it. Our city demographics, I know the chief covered these uh, just briefly, but th these are based on the 2010 census. Uh, so you can see that, um, you know, the, the minority population in Sterling Heights uh, uh, for the various uh, uh, races is, is fairly low, but growing, growing rapidly. We expect in the next census uh, that the black population in Sterling Heights will be at least 10% our Asian population growing as well. Uh, but um, certainly anecdotally, we believe the, the black population is growing the fastest. So we talked about what police is doing. And so you, the question uh, for us as a community is, is are we making progress and, and is it enough? And the simple answer is, if we're talking about religious and ethnic diversity, the answer is undoubtedly absolutely. Uh, I think most would agree we're doing a, a really good job on that front. Uh, when it comes to uh, racial diversity and inclusiveness, the answer is we can do better. Uh, we're, we're making progress, but we can do better. So then how can we do better? What, what should we be doing? And so what we're really pleased to uh, announce this evening is the creation of the Sterling Heights African American Coalition. Uh, so the purpose of this coalition is to create a forum to connect with the city's 10,000 plus black residents to discuss challenges and opportunities centered on racial equity. We see what's going on across the country, as I mentioned, starting out. Uh, we have lived and breathed the protests over the last month. Many protests right here in Sterling Heights. There's simply no denying that there is a problem in the country. And there's no denying that the 10,000 plus black residents in Sterling Heights are affected uh, by this situation, undoubtedly. So the role of a, of a community a city, a proactive city, a city that is doing all that it can in the spirit of inclusiveness and diversity is to address these challenges head on and, and to build bridges and partnerships and collaborate in, in uh, any way possible. And I see now that my computer went down, so I'll continue. Uh, uh, Okay, I think I'm back. Can you still hear me? Okay, You're, we, we got sorry. you back on, on your slides. It looked like it cycled through again, Mark. All right, I am so sorry about this. Uh, so let me, which slide can you see right now? Right Co now we're on coalition stakeholders. Okay, so that is where we should be. So. The stakeholders for the coalition are obviously our African American residents. That that's who this group is is absolutely intended for. Um, other stakeholders would include community leaders from the city, from education, from the health sector, uh, from business, and, and certainly clergy. You know, we have a clergy forum in Sterling Heights, as the chief mentioned. Uh, we want to make sure that we can use the resources of the clergy forum, um, use them as stakeholders, and also regional representatives as stakeholders, including uh, members, uh, representatives from Black Lives Matter, the Macomb Ministerial Alliance, the National Association for Advancement of Colored People, the Macomb County Interfaith Center for Racial Justice. Uh, so uh, these are the the obvious stakeholders. There'll be many other stakeholders that we'll need to partner with uh, in, in uh, uh, standing up this group. And now I will say this, it, this is not the first time that the city has created uh, such an organization. Uh, we've done this actually in many cases. Uh, we created a, early on a community foundation 
uh, we created a group that's called the Macomb Area Communities for Regional Opportunities, now known as MACRO. Uh, the city created the Sterling Heights Drug Coalition, uh, which the chief talked about some. Uh, we've created the, the Clergy Forum and, and Innovate Mound, which is a massive uh, uh, effort to uh, uh, revitalize uh, Mound Road. So, so this is not the first time we're we're creating an organization of this sort, but it's certainly the first time that we're doing it for the purposes stated. So we're excited to uh, stand up this group. We have already about 12 uh, black residents that have agreed to serve on this uh, coalition. <clears throat> we have many others that have uh, expressed interest. I would imagine that the coalition would grow to uh, 20 plus members easily. Uh, so our goal is to have a meeting in the first in the next uh, 30 days and to meet perhaps monthly initially and then uh, probably uh, scaling back to quarterly meetings as time goes on. Uh, but to conclude, this effort is all centered on our uh, vision statement. Uh, now, if you allow me uh, just a couple of minutes to to talk about another really important um, item. And, and that is also in the spirit of inclusiveness. And there's two very important proclamations uh, that the city is, is um, um, approving. Uh, first, the first proclamation is uh, Juneteenth. So Juneteenth is, uh, independent, is a Independence Day recognized throughout much of the country as a date on which slavery came to an end in the United States. President Abraham Lincoln first issued the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 19, 1863, freeing many slaves, slaves in the South. However, the Emancipation Proclamation did not apply to certain slaveholding states, including the state of Texas until after the end of the Civil War. The Civil War effectively ended on April 9, 1865. However, news of the end of the Civil War and the Emancipation Proclamation did not reach the frontier areas of the United States, like Texas and other Southwestern states for two months, and more than two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation was issued. So on June 19, 1865, Union soldiers led by Major General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston, Texas with news that the Civil War had ended and all slaves were free. And since then, African-American communities have recognized June 19 as Juneteenth Independence Day, a day for celebration, inspiration, encouragement, and remembrance. And in this spirit, the city of Sterling Heights celebrates that Americans of all colors, creeds, cultures, religions, and countries of origin share a common respect and love for freedom and recognizes that Juneteenth Independence Day historically means to the United States and all Americans by proclaiming healing, reconciliation, sincere discussion, and reflection. So with that in mind, June 19th has been declared as Juneteenth Independence Day in the city of Sterling Heights. And that action uh, has been initiated today by a, uh, via mayoral proclamation. And the second proclamation I wanted to highlight is here again, consistent with the city's Visioning 2030 statement is um, uh, the fact that June has become a symbolic month around the world for LGBTQ plus people and friends to come together in various celebrations of acceptance of equity and pride. And here again, uh, the mayor and city council are proclaiming June 2020 as Pride Month in the city of Sterling Heights and encourage all residents, employers, and community organizations in Sterling Heights to celebrate the valuable contributions of the LGBTQ plus community who enrich the diversity and vitality of our neighborhoods, institutions, government, organizations, and businesses. And Mayor, I'd like to conclude by thanking you and the city council for leading the way and in making inclusivity a guiding light in all that we do in the city of Sterling Heights. And Mayor, that concludes my report this evening. 
All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Vanderpool. Uh, a lot of great information there, and we appreciate uh, your hard work in uh, preparing that presentation and the chief and everybody else who had a hand in uh, creating it. I'm proud of the proclamations that you highlighted at the end. The uh, coalition building has been something that we've done very well um, for you name it. Um, Mound Road, infrastructure, things like that, but uh, we can do better, we must do better. So on behalf of the City Council, we wanna thank you for that presentation. With that, we will move on uh, to the next item on our agenda, which is a public hearing. And this is a 2020-2021 budget public hearing and adoption. We have a presentation from our Finance and Budget Director, Jennifer Varney, Mrs. Varney. Good evening again, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Kaszubski, Mr. Van Der Poel, and members of council. The city charter requires that a formal public hearing be held on the budget before its adoption. First, a brief overview of the budget highlights that we have discussed. The proposed budget was submitted to the city council on May 18th, 2020. And since May 29th, the budget has been available for public inspection on the city's website at the city's clerk's office since our reopening on June 10th and by appointment prior to that. The appropriations ordinance was introduced at the June 2nd city council meeting. And now to br briefly review. The proposed city budget totals $213.9 million and the breakdown between the major funds can be seen here. The total budget decreased 55.5 million or 20.6% over the prior year. There is decreased spending in nearly every fund, including capital projects, major roads, recreating recreation, facilities improvements, road bond construction, and local roads. The general fund budget increased 2.6 million or 2.5% over last year. Cost increases were seen in personnel, pension contributions, and health insurance. Savings were realized in retiree health care contributions, capital projects transfers, debt payments, and liability insurance. Due to expected reductions in revenue, primarily in state revenue sharing, permit fees, court fines, and interest income, the general fund budget was reduced by an additional 2.2 million, and there is no increase in full-time headcount included in the proposed budget. One amendment was proposed and approved at the budget introduction. $25,000 was added to the proposed budget to fund return postage on absentee ballots for the November 2020 presidential election. General fund revenues are lower than proposed expenses by 2.6 million. A use of fund balance is proposed. We are expected to add 1.2 million to general fund balance in the current fiscal year bringing our percentage of expenditures to 25.7%. The proposed use of fund balance will reduce our percentage to 23.6, still a very healthy amount, and will give us time to evaluate the constantly changing economic conditions and bring any necessary amendments to city council in December. The city tax rate will remain the same at 16.2069 mills, our tax rate is once again one of the lowest in Macomb County cities and is 6.3 mils lower than the county average. And although the average selling price for a single family home increased 4.9% last year, taxable value increases are capped by inflation and will increase only 1.9%. And the average city tax bill will be only $104 a month for all city services. This is only a $2 per month increase over last year. And as a reminder, a detailed budget video, including presentations from every city director, is available on our website, along with the complete budget document. The appropriations ordinance is a legislative vehicle that allows for the expenditure of city funds throughout the city. The ordinance reflects the city council's plans for expenditures and revenues and sets the total property tax millage rate at 16.2069 to fund those expenditures. The appropriations ordinance was introduced at the June 2nd city council meeting. And since then we've had one change, $25,000 was added to fund the return postage on absentee ballots for the November 2020 presidential election. 
And with these changes, Mr. Mayor, the final amended appropriations ordinance is now ready to be adopted. Thank you very much, Ms. Varney. At this time, I'm going to open up the public hearing. As stated earlier, we are receiving public comments on this item via teleconference tonight. Those members of the public on the phone that wish to participate on this agenda item will be recognized in turn and asked whether you have a comment at that time. All other members of the public will continue to be muted until called upon. If you wish to participate on this item, please press star nine. Star nine will notify me that your hand is raised and that you desire to speak. If you're on the line and would like to participate, now is the time to press star nine. Looks like we only have one guest participating. I'll give one more second. Um, does not look like anyone wishes to participate on this. So I will close the public hearing at this point. And council, we need a motion. Mayor Taylor. Mayor Pro Tem Sarowski. Resolve proceed. to, thank you. Resolve to introduce the final amendment to the appropriations ordinance for the 2019-2020 fiscal year. Support. Miss Miss Sarowski, I, I read the I'm thinking you read the wrong one. Oh, there we go. Okay, the be it ordained part. Yeah. So why don't you withdraw your motion? I will withdraw my motion and ask okay. to inst uh, uh, inst induct a new ordinance. Okay. Motion. Your motion. Your motion has been withdrawn. Mrs. Sarowski, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mayor Taylor. Appreciate your uh, guidance on this. Be it ordained to adopt the annual appropriations ordinance as amended for the 2020 fiscal year to the following, for the following property tax millages, rates, and that is 9.3106 mills for mm -hmm. operation. Mr. Mayor, um, I have a question. I'm sorry to interrupt. On our agenda, I, the, the, first, the first thing is approval of the 2019-20 final amendment. We're now on item B on the consideration I think we skipped the step here. Mr. Mr. Radke, thank you. Um, the agenda was updated. The first item is item 6A, public hearing. You were uh, given the- Plus, uh, wrong agenda. I think that's why we're, we're probably off, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, you were given an email this afternoon uh, with, the, with the current updated agenda. So that, that was just a mistake, I believe, on the, um, on what was given to us earlier. So with that, the first, this item is in order. It's the public hearing. This is item 6A. So Miss um, Sarowski, could you, I'm sorry, could you start over again? We're gonna have you start from the top, the be it ordained, okay. floor is yours. Thank you, I appreciate it. So again, be it ordained to adopt the annual appropriations ordinance as amended for the 2020-2021 fiscal year with the following property tax millage rates, 9.3106 mills for operations, 0.9639 mills for refuse collection, 2.4441 mills for police and fire pension, 2.4343 mills for safe streets, 0.9443 mills for recreating recreation, and 0 0.1097 mills for public improvements, otherwise known as Proposal F, for a total prox tech property tax levy of 16.2069 mills. Support. It's been moved and supported. Is there any discussion, Mrs. Sarowski? No, I think that we've discussed this at length. We have a there has been that amendment that we have worked into this that I also agree with. So I am very happy with the budget as is. Thank, Thank you, Mrs. Sarowski. Council, is there anyone else with any discussion on this item? Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Schmidt. Thank you. Um, you know, I've thought long and hard over the past two weeks about the adoption of this budget. And um, if you would indulge me, I have some comments that I would like to read because it's important to me that I don't leave anything out. Uh, let me start by saying that in these unprecedented times with COVID-19 pandemic and the social issues seeming to divide our country, 
It is important to me that all elected officials come together and unify for the good of the people and communities we were elected to represent. We cannot let our disagreements on certain issues affect our judgment when it comes to critical decisions. There are not many decisions that this council makes that are more important than the adoption of the annual city budget. I am confident that my fellow members take this annual review and adoption very seriously. Of course, that can lead to disagreements, which is part of the process. At the introduction of the budget, I voiced my strong opp opposition to the budget amendment that reduced the general fund balance by $25,000 to pay for return postage on absentee ballots. I want to be clear on this point. My opposition to paying for return postage has nothing to do with my total confidence in our voting process. In fact, I was pleased when my suggestion of adding additional drop boxes at the fire stations was acted upon giving more free opportunities to cast a ballot without the concern of standing in line at the polls. I also do not believe that residents in the past have failed to vote because of the burden of paying return postage. This is, a pr this is proven by the outstanding rate of return balance, ballots without the amendment. My opposition is based on priorities and a belief that this $25,000 can and should be reserved until we more fully understand the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on city finances. I now have to decide whether to vote against a budget based on the outcome of a budget amendment that I do not agree with for the reasons I have stated. And I think it is imperative to support a proposed budget, which on the whole is very good and deserves my support. So tonight I will be voting to adapt the budget with the strong belief that it merits the support of the whole city council. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Schmidt. Council, is there any further discussion on this item? Mayor Taylor? Mrs. Zarco. Um, yes, and I'm going to be short. Um, I certainly, um, give a lot of credit to our financial department and putting this budget together. I don't think it would be appropriate to um, reject the entire budget based on one line item. So I too will um, be um, voting yes on this budget, even though it's the one line item um, regarding the return postage on our, our ballots that um, I question whether it's necessary right now. And I have nothing further. Thank you, Ms. Sarko. Council, anyone else? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Radke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, budgets are uh, just basically an assemblage of the priorities for the city. And we don't have to agree with every single item in the budget to support the budget as a whole. I mean, I could stand here at the podium and discuss many things that we've voted for over the years that I think are crazy to spend money from out of the budget but we've spent money on them. We tore down the Sunnybrook sign and lost $10,000 in the deal. That's $10,000 right there. You know, we've spent money on any number of, of ideas. We, we spent money to, to, to sweep the parking lots of businesses to make sure that the community was being kept safe from harm. That came out of our budget. It came out of the funds that we're spending. So while I can understand the qualms, I support this budget because we're doing the best we can for all the people who are gonna be voting this fall. I'm glad it was adopted. I'm gonna vote in favor of it. But the idea that this somehow is, is one item that is just so far outside the norm of what we spend money on here in Sterling Heights is, is a farce. We, I vote against many things at this council table that we've spent money on over the years that I thought was not correct. I lost. At the same time, I still voted for all the budgets and all the amendments going forward because I have to support the city to make sure we pay our debts. So I guess I appreciate everyone's concerns. I'm glad that we're going to have an opportunity to do this this year. I think it's gonna be a tremendous success and I fully expect that we'll probably be doing this again next year because of the success. So that's all I have, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Radke, Any, Mrs. Kosky. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would just like to make a comment that the budget is our best guess as to the expenses of the city for the next 12 months. In my time on council, I've learned that the budget is not 
cut in stone. Changes are made, things have to be adjusted because we cannot predict exactly what's going to happen in the next 12 months. So we do the best we can. Sometimes everything is not spent. Sometimes we have to make adjustments. So maybe we won't pay for that postage. Maybe there'll be a miracle and the government will say, you get free return postage. So this is something that we want to do for the people. We're doing the best that we can as far as setting the budget. So as I said, it's not cut in stone. There are going to be adjustments made. In fact, we're planning on making an adjustment probably in December. So as well, thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Koski. Anyone else, council? If not, I just wanna reiterate what I said last week, two weeks ago that this was uh, quite an effort from a number of people, dozens of people uh, under the leadership of our finance and budget director, Mrs. Varney. We thank you for your leadership here in providing us what uh, none of us would have predicted uh, for three or four months ago, that we would be coming uh, you know, just two weeks before the fiscal year started, approving a budget with $5 million in reductions um, so it's it's really quite a uh, quite a testament to your hard work and dedication and your team. So we thank you for that and thank all of the employees who had a hand in creating this. As Mrs. Koski said, we know that there is going to be unpredictability uh, every year. This year, particularly, we still don't know what's going to be coming down from the federal government. We understand that we're going to be getting a substantial amount of money from the county flowing uh, through the county from the federal government. Uh, but, uh, but we are all going to have to uh, get used to the idea that things are not going to be the same uh, anytime soon. So we thank you for your leadership on this and for the presentations that you've made, the videos from the different departments. And uh, we do believe that the residents of Sterling Heights are well served by the team that we have uh, here steering the ship. So thank you, Ms. Varney. Council, without any further discussion, I would ask our city clerk, uh, Ms. Riska for the, the, by the way, the 2020 city clerk of the year, Ms. Riska, which you unfortunately, you got short shrift because your slide was, uh, was not shown earlier, but we'll make sure to get you back. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get that back. Uh, maybe at the next meeting. Ms. Riska, can we please have a roll call vote? Sure. Uh, Mr. Yanez? Yes. Mrs. Yarko? Yes. Mrs. Koski? Yes. Mr. Radke? Yes. Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. Mrs. Soroski? Yes. And Mayor Taylor? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Riska. Motion carries 7-0. Move on to the next item on our agenda. This is an ordinance introduction. This is item 7A. This is to introduce the final amendment to the appropriations ordinance for the 2019-2020 fiscal year. We have a presentation again from our finance and budget director, Jennifer Varney. Ms. Varney. Hello again, everyone. Uh, speaking of uh, fluid budgets, I'm here to present the uh, final amendment to the 2019-2020 budget. Let me get that up. So toward the end of the fiscal year, the budget office prepares a final amendment to the appropriations ordinance to estimate how we expect to finish the fiscal year, which ends in just a few weeks. So general fund revenues are projected to come in about 3 million or 2.8% higher than originally budgeted. Revenue variances are seen in primarily in five different areas as are depicted on this chart. We saw a decrease in license and permit fees of about 295,000 directly related to the COVID shutdown. We expect to see an increase in grant revenue of about 870,000. Uh, we're expecting reimbursement conservatively of about 75% of our COVID related expenses, either from FEMA or from the Macomb County through the CARES funding. We'll talk a little bit about, more about those expenses in a few minutes. And we also have higher receipts from the SAFER grant um, due to some receipts coming in this year that were expected from last year. 
Revenue from fines and forfeitures was down about 815,000 and that's directly related to this shutdown at the court. And state revenue sharing is only down about 80,000 this year and that's due to loss of sales tax revenue from the shutdown. But we expect to see a significant revenue sharing drop um, next year and that was included in the adopted budget. Now every year we get um, this personal property tax reimbursement, um, that's this extra personal property tax reimbursement that we don't include in the operating budget because it's a one-time funding that's not guaranteed. Uh, this year we, we did receive it again, it was 3.4 million. Now 625 of that is directly related to the police and fire pension fund tax and we have to use it for that. So this year we use that 625,000 to offset the pension tax for the 2021 fiscal year, and that reduced the millage for residents. So by using that money to offset our required contribution, we were able to charge a lower millage uh, to residents for the police and fire pension fund. Now, this is the last year that we'll receive this, the, our personal property tax reimbursement under the old formula. In 2021, the state is, there's a new formula that's being um, phased in and as of now, the state has not provided any estimates as to what that might look like. So in theory, it's based on our proportionate share of personal property acquisition costs. So it's very hard to predict because it's based on our share of the total state's acquisition costs. So with it, without having numbers from the state, it, it's a very difficult number to predict the first year. Our general fund expenditures came in about 2.4% higher than budgeted. And the bulk is due to the timing of recreating recreation projects. So we're winding down, we're finishing up our projects. And so um, we needed an additional $2.7 million as the construction is nearing completion. So all of these projects are funded through the recreating recreation millage. However, there is a timing issue and we, we we used our extra personal property to fund the end of these projects, but over time, the recreating recreation millage will earn enough money to transfer that money back to the general fund. So other main expenditure variance is depicted here. Um, the actual debt payment for the DPW building came in 400,000 less than was estimated in the budget. Now expenses due to the COVID emergency totaled just under 630,000. And I, again, we've conservatively estimated that we'll receive reimbursement for at least 75% of these expenditures. I actually think it will be higher, uh, but I wanted to be on the conservative side. And I'm gonna discuss these expenses in detail on the next slide. So fire department expenditures other than COVID were up about 140,000. And most of that was due to grant funded fitness equipment and physicals. Police department expenditures were down 340,000 due to lower salaries and overtime than expected. City administration costs were up 370,000. And this was primarily due to the addition of the facilities maintenance director, which was approved by council in December and the emergency repair to the elevator pumps at the court, the library and city hall. And lastly, the Public Works Department was down 210,000 due to lower part-time and overtime wages in street services. So as you may expect, the city incurred many unbudgeted expenses due to the COVID-19 crisis. Through June 30th, these expenses totaled just under 627,000 and are detailed here. Facility upgrades include the installation of plexiglass on service counters around copiers as bar and as barriers for bus drivers, as well as the disinfecting of all city building buildings and park amenities on a regular basis. Work at home technology was purchased, including laptops and video conferencing software and equipment. Legal fees were incurred to interpret and apply executive orders issued by the governor. Gloves, masks, face shields, and other personal protection equipment was purchased for first responders and other city employees. And other supplies include hand sanitizer, disinfectant spray and wipes, thermometers, and other items to keep residents and employees safe. Many of these expenses will be reimbursed through either FEMA or other CARES Act funding. 
And again, I am estimating about 75% of this should be reimbursed. And note that this list only represents our costs and does not include the revenue losses that we have dis discussed previously. And at this time, there is no mechanism to reimburse those revenue losses. So the bottom line is for the current fiscal year, we are budgeted to add about 1.25 million to fund balance. And this is about 400,000 more than the original budget. So this will bring our general fund balance percentage to just under 26% further cushioning the expected use of fund balance proposed in the 2021 budget. The budget for other city funds increased by 4.6 million and it's primarily due to several items. The addition of a 1.2 million to the 2019 major road concrete reconstruction program, the advanced funding for Pond View and 19 Mile. Now these projects were budgeted in the 2021 budget that was just adopted, but we often advance funds to get those started in the spring construction season. The purchase of the church property near Donovan Park is in the land and water fund. And again, the timing of construction costs for recreating recreation amenities. So we had some costs that move forward to this budget year, but then next budget year, those, um, those costs will be reduced. We had an increase in the budget for the Indigent Defense Fund, and that is 100% grant funded through the state. We have an expected payout from the Brownfield Fund to Ashley Capital for eligible expenditures, and an increase in the Capital Projects Fund to fund laptops for employees working at home. And lastly, a decrease in the Road Bond Construction Fund, and this is due to the revised schedule for the Mound Road Reconstruction, so costs that were expected this year have moved forward. Mr. Mayor, this is the first reading of this ordinance, which is scheduled for adoption at the first meeting in July. Thank you very much, Mrs. Varney. Varney. Council, we need a motion. Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Sorowski. Let's do it this time. So I res we resolve to introduce the final amendment to the appropriations ordinance for the 2019-2020 fiscal year. Is there a second? I'll support it. It's been moved and supported. Is there any discussion, uh, Mrs. Sorowski? No, it's been quite well explained. And yes, we do understand that there are always adjustments over the years. So I have no question. Okay, thank you, Ms. Sorowski. Council, anyone else, any discussion on this item? With no further discussion, Ms. Riska, can we please have a roll call vote? Mrs. Diarco? Yes. Mrs. Kosky? Yes. Mr. Radke? Yes. Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. Mrs. Sarasky? Yes. Mayor Taylor? Yes. And Mr. Yannis? Yes. Motion carries 7-0. Next item on our agenda tonight is the consent agenda. Would someone like the floor to make that motion? Mr. Mayor. Mrs. Kosky. Move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Is there a second? Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Arco. Um, second. Consent agenda has been moved and seconded. Ms. Riska, can we please have a roll call vote? Mrs. Kosky? Yes. Mr. Radke? Yes. Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. Mrs. Sarasky? Yes. Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mr. Yanez? Yes. Mrs. Yarko? Yes. Motion carries 7-0. Next item on our agenda tonight is a consideration item. And this is to consider adoption of a resolution to place an amendment to sections 5.01 and 3.13 of the city charter on the ballot for the November 3rd, 2020 general election. Council, we need a motion. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Yanez. Resolved to adopt the resolution to place a proposed amendment 
to section 5.01 of the city charter to provide four year terms for mayor and city council and a proposed amendment to section 3.13 of the city charter to set the signature requirement for nominating petitions for city office to a minimum of 400 and a maximum amount of 1000 registered voters, uh, voter signatures on the ballot for the November 3rd, 2020 general election. Support. Been moved and supported by Ms. Sorowski. Council, is there any discussion? Mr. Yanez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I think these are both um, well thought out uh, um, plans to uh, not only secure, um, secure uh, ballot signatures in a more amenable way, the, the under what we have right now is, is uh, pretty daunting, especially now in the age of um, pandemic and who knows what the, the future holds. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very difficult task, even though we've completed it, but uh, 400 really kind of brings us into the, uh, into the arena where a lot of other municipalities are at. So I think, uh, and having a static number like 400, we don't have to, uh, each election ask, you know, what, what the number is, and it, it varies uh, every election year. So we know we need 400 at a, at a minimum. Uh, I think we've settled on a good number. As far as the four-year terms go, uh, you know, stability is very important. And the, the idea that as soon as you get elected, you start running for office again with two-year terms um, really attacks stability at its core. So I think having four-year terms uh, is, uh, is going to be uh, uh, beneficial to the city as a whole uh, to keep uh, um, some stability as we move forward through uh, through the future and to make sure that we uh, um, we're all focused on doing the right thing and uh, for our city. So I, th I think these are both uh, good uh, proposals. Thank you, Mr. Yanez. Ms. Sorowski. Yes, thank you, Mayor Taylor. I just want to briefly echo what uh, Mr. Yanis did say. Yes, I do believe that this is taking the world as it is now and trying to find the best solutions for everyone. It is daunting to get the, the number of signatures that we are required at this time. With a two-year term, you're back and running immediately. It doesn't allow us to do the work that we need to do. It also doesn't allow us to be able to just focus on the city. And so I'm I'm very happy with this. I also think that it's much more fair for those that are not incumbents to have a chance to at least get their names on the ballot, to run, to run a good campaign before it's, it's very hard. And with the inability now to probably not gonna be able to go door to door, standing outside and getting signatures, the only place we can get them right now is at the library and people are gonna wanna come up to us. They're not gonna want us coming up to them. So getting those signatures, even 400 is gonna be enough, an interesting task. But at this point, I think it's fair. And I do believe that it, uh, a four year term with the, those numbers makes it more inclusive and we're working on that. So I, I'm really happy with this. So that's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sorowski. And as somebody who stood out there for the last 10 years, <laughs> they didn't wanna come talk to us even when we were not potentially <laughs> carrying a deadly communicable disease. So I can only imagine now. Uh, Council, anyone else on this item? Mrs. Mr. Darko. Oh, Mrs. Darko. Um, Mayor Taylor, um, I firmly believe that we did need to make some changes in the number of signatures. Um, we've talked about it for a lot of years and we seem to always postpone it and, and putting it on the ballot for residents to decide. Um, I have to say that initially I wanted a percentage um, of signatures and for a couple of reasons, it was saying consistent with what was already in the charter. So, um, you know, I thought that um, 0.5 would have been a good number and we're only talking about I think I believe about 32, 35 signatures between uh, the flat rate and the percentage. However, um, it's a little disappointing if we're following um, state guidelines because for a city our size, um, other cities are required as much as 600 signatures. So we reduced it a lot. Um, I am going to vote in favor of putting it on the ballot as it was presented 
However, it's going to be how the residents decide to vote for this. So in, to, in reality, I'm still planning on a thousand signatures because you don't know if residents are actually going to um, approve this. So nothing further. Thank you, Mrs. Zarko. Mr. Radke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just have a few uh, questions. One thing about uh, these two proposals, I think they're out of order. If proposal one is a four year term and proposal two is a signature requirement, I would argue they should appear on the ballot, a signature requirement first and then a uh, four year term second. I think that when you put the, the four year term first, it, 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 the whole idea behind all of this was to make it easier to run for office, to build a greater campaign, and then to extend our ability to, uh, to serve the residents and not have to look over our shoulders every 20 minutes to run for office. I think we're just putting them out of order. That would be my first concern. My second concern is that I, I was a strong advocate for a tie bar amendment, uh, question number three, to change how we appoint council members after the, uh, the, if someone leaves. Right now, if they're appointed during a, a four year term, they could leave the day after election day, as long as they swear the oath, and you could appoint someone to almost four years without having an intervening election. And I don't think that's that's right for the residents. I would offer an amendment to add a question for you, but I think it would fail. I think I'm the only one in support of it right here. But I just wanted to put a marker down saying that I think that this is, uh, well, I support the first two questions. I think without a third uh, answer to how we appoint people, it might end up being undemocratic. So I will support these as they're written, but I am, I'm in favor of a question three still that would uh, change how we appoint people to make sure that the residents get to weigh in and people can't serve three years plus without having been voted into office. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Radke. Mayor Mrs. Taylor, Schmidt. thank you. Um, through the chair to Mr. Kaszubski. Mr. Kaszubski, the way the charter is written right now, doesn't council have the option of going to a special election if there is a vacancy created? Mr. Kaszubski. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, Mr. Schmidt. The uh, charter at the moment uh, provides that the council has the option to appoint someone, but if they fail to appoint within the 60 day window that is allowed, then a special election will be called to fill the vacancy. Okay. Okay. Um, Thank you. As far as the four-year terms, I think um, what Mr. Yana said is really the nail on the head of uh, consistency. And um, the, the residents themselves, when they're signing those petitions every two years, say, God, we just signed these. Well, yeah, you did, but we only have two-year terms. And I think um, the mindset when you have a two-year term is um, that, A, if you're new on council, the learning curve is about a year to get comfortable at the table and to have to be running for re-election while you're still trying to learn your position is, it's a very daunting task. And, and I think that um, the four-year terms, I know we've asked the residents in the past, um, but I, I really hope that they consider this because it does help not only council consistency with the residents, but administration consistency as well. So, you know, you work as a team with, with everybody in the city and when that, that team can be changed every two years upended, um, it, it can be unnerving and, and make for a lot of work that isn't necessary every two years. So I'm in full support. And as far as the signatures go, um, I, I as well was thinking of the 0.5%, um, only that because the number of voters um, is not a static number, it, it changes, it has nothing to do with the census, um, but I, I am satisfied with the 400 as well. I'm not gonna quabble over at this point this point, you know, 32 signatures. So um, I'm comfortable with both um, amendments to the charter being put onto the ballot. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Schmidt. Mrs. Koski. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like to address this question to Mr. Vanderpool. Uh, 
what if in the event that we have a second outbreak of this COVID-19, you and I talked about this before, that you have the ability to do a PPO to address our ability of getting signatures. Can you explain that, please? Mr. Vanderpool. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Councilwoman Koski, it's a very good question. Um, the reality is that if we experience uh, an extension of this pandemic um, or if we have another pandemic, uh, God forbid, um, we would likely be in a declared uh, local emergency and or a declared countywide emergency. In this particular case, a statewide emergency. So let me back up. When we declare a local emergency, which we had to do in this particular case, and that local emergency is still in effect and likely will be for a number of weeks longer, uh, a local emergency declaration uh, provides the city um, numerous uh, authorities uh, outside the scope of the charter. Um, so for example, in this particular case or in any emergency, you often would have to expend money that isn't budgeted. Uh, we would have to expend money that's above the limit of uh, $10,000 for council approval and we wouldn't have time to get to city council for approval. So, so that's the whole point of a, a local emergency declaration is to provide uh, um, unorthodox uh, or unusual authorities and powers that wouldn't normally exist. Now there's checks and balances with that as well. Uh, but for example, in this particular case, uh, you could uh, issue uh, an executive order or administration could issue an executive order um, that would um, uh, decrease the number of signatures required. In other words, the charter requirement would be suspended. We just did that with the budget, for example. The charter requires that the budget uh, be submitted on a given date. It wasn't possible to do that uh, because of the pandemic that was at hand. And through an executive order, we had to uh, suspend that charter requirement and we had to develop new dates for the budget submittal. So the exact same phenomenon could happen with this. If we're in such a pandemic and we have a situation of candidates not being able to get signatures, that could be reduced through an executive order uh, to 200 signatures, to 100 signatures, 50 signatures, whatever the case may be. Of course, prior to doing that, there would be collaboration you know, publicly and with the um, uh, incumbent city council members, you know, that just wouldn't arbitrarily be done. Uh, the executive orders that have been issued to date have been done in a very transparent, open, uh, collaborative way. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Mrs. Koski. I don't really have too much left to say. I, I mean, I think I spoke uh, at length about this previously, and I've given my thoughts on why I think four-year terms and a reduced signature requirement are both important uh, as part of a good government here in the city of Sterling Heights. So um, I'm uh, enthusiastically going to be voting yes, and it looks like this is going to be on the ballot. I'm hoping that uh, we have the opportunity uh, to uh, get some information out to the residents about this, and, uh, and everybody gives this a good hard look in November. Um, and uh, so with that, I would uh, ask Ms. Riska for a roll call vote. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to ask Ms. one more question of, of Mr. Kashiki, if I could. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Radke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for indulging me. Um, to the chair, to Mr. Kashiki, if we were to administratively lower the signature requirement, how likely are we to get challenged in court and how likely are we to win that challenge in court because that would be then we're monkeying around with the machinery of an election. Mr. Kaszubski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councilman Radke, the idea of making it easier to get on the ballot will make it very difficult for someone to challenge that. You're actually, if you're lowering the threshold to uh, allow more people the opportunity to get on, I don't see anyone who would have standing to object uh, to that idea. Um, so I, th I think, although it would be 
not unprecedented as the state, um, uh, there was a recent uh, court case where they were unable to, where the, um, uh, the people attempting to get on a ballot were unable to get signatures where the court uh, ruled that, that was not appropriate and issued an order lowering the signature requirement. Um, in those cases, when you're making it easier for someone uh, to get onto a ballot, it is harder for them to challenge. Okay, that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Radke. Mrs. Riska. Mr. Radke? Yes. Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. Mrs. Sarasky? Yes. Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mr. Yanez? Yes. Mrs. Yarko? Yes. And Mrs. Kasky? Yes. All right, motion carries 7-0. This will be placed on the November general election ballot. Next up is to consider nominations to City of Sterling Heights boards and commissions. Uh, so the this agenda item, there's only one, I believe there's, this is the one with only one, correct, Mr. Kaszewski? This is the Zoning yes. Board of Appeals. I believe it's Zoning Board of Appeals. There's a nomination uh, open. Okay, so we have a uh, nomination to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Is there anyone who would like to make a nomination to the Zoning Board of Appeals? Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Zarco. Uh, resolve to nominate Dennis Hang Hansinger for consideration as an appointee to the Zoning Board of Appeals at the July 7th, 2020 regular City Council meeting. Support. It's been moved and supported, Mrs. Zarco. Um, I, you know what? I'm just, I haven't talked to Mr. Hansinger recently. However, um, during the um, stay at home order, I've been going through a lot of my materials from the city to, you know, make sure that they're, um, you know, we do something with them properly. I'm waiting to drop off a box to City Hall. And I noticed in there the applications that we had for the last opening on City Council. And in my notes, I had on there, great candidate for a commission. And so it, as I was looking um, over the, um, the nominees and his uh, choice um, for zoning um, Board of Appeals is num his second choice. So I thought it would be a great opportunity for him to um, serve. And uh, nothing further. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Zarco. Council, anyone else? Any discussion? Mr. Mayor. With Mr. Radke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm not going to object to Mr. Hansinger as a person, but the Zoning Board of Appeals is all men and all white. And the idea that we can't find one female or one minority candidate in all of our applications to put on this board befuddles me. And it's going to continue to be all male and all white until we make a change. I'll be voting against this just because it's not a diversity candidate. Not nothing against Mr. Hessinger. I think he's probably a great candidate, but the board is all male and all white, and I want to change that. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you, Mr. Radke. Council, anyone else? Without any further discussion, uh, Mrs. Riska, can we please have a roll call vote? Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. Mrs. Sarasky? Yes. Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mr. Yanez? Yes. Mrs. Yarko? Yes. Mrs. Kasky? Yes. And Mr. Radke? No. All right. Thank you, Ms. Riska. Motion carries six to one. Next item on our agenda is to consider. Appointments to City of Sterling Heights Boards and Commissions, and uh, this time without objection, I would like to allow all appointments to the same board or commission with the same term ending to be taken together unless someone objects to a particular appointment. Also, to the extent that we do not have an appointment to any board or commission, I would ask that we entertain one motion to postpone these appointments at the end of this item to the June 16th. I'm sorry, this should be the July 7th, 2020 regular city council meeting. Uh, hearing no objection, I'm gonna go through these 
The first is first is the planning commission. So we have a couple of these that are going to be a, based on the two-step process, and some of these that are going to be based on the uh, one-step process. Uh, the planning commission. Uh, these are three nominees who are uh, seeking appointment. Uh, so is there a council member that would like to take all three of the two-step process appointments to the planning commission? Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Schmidt. Resolve to appoint Lori Doty, Nathan Inks, and Edward Kopp to the planning commission to terms ending June 30th, 2023, subject to the appointees meeting the qualifications set forth in charter 4.03 and taking the oath of office within two weeks. Support. It's been moved and supported. Is there any discussion? With no discussion, Ms. Riska, can we please have a roll call vote? Mrs. Sereski? Yes. Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mr. Yanez? Yes. Mrs. Yarko? Yes. Mrs. Koski? Yes. Mr. Radke? Yes. Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. Motion carries 7-0. Next up is the Board of Code Appeals. This is an appointment uh, after nomination. The nominee is Thomas Zetkowski to a term ending June 30th, 2025. Council, is there a motion? Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Sorowski. Resolved to appoint Thomas Zetkowski to the Board of, Board of Code Appeals to a term ending June 30th, 2025 subject to the appointee meeting the qualifications set forth in Charter Subset 4.03 and taking the oath of office within two weeks. Support. Support. It's been moved and supported. Is there any discussion? No, thank you very much. I think you make no it. Go ahead. With no discussion, Ms. Riska, can we please have a, well, with minimal discussion for Ms. Sorowski, can we have a roll call vote, please? Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mr. Yanez? Yes. Mrs. Yarko? Yes. Mrs. Koski? Yes. Mr. Radke? Yes. Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. Mrs. Sorowski? Yes. Motion carries. Next is the Board of Ordinance Appeals. This is uh, one nominee seeking appointment uh, tonight, Michael Stickney to a term ending June 30th, 2022. Is there a council member who will make this appointment? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Radke. Resolved to appoint Michael Stickney to the Board of Ordinance Appeals 1 to a term ending June 30th, 2022, subject to the appointing meeting the qualifications set forth in Charter Subsection 4.03 and taking the oath of office within two weeks. Support. It's been moved and supported. Is there any discussion? With no discussion, Ms. Riska, can we please have a roll call vote? Mr. Yanez? Yes. Mrs. Yarko? Yes. Mrs. Koski? Yes. Mr. Radke? Yes. Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. Mrs. Sorowski? Yes. Mayor Taylor. Yes. Motion carries. Next is the Board of Ordinance Appeals 2. There are uh, three members seeking appointment. Roman Stoilowski, Steve Jukic, Ben and Kona. These are all different term ending dates. So we're gonna to need to take these one at a time. Is there a council member who'd like to make the first one? Here, Taylor. Mrs. Sorowski. I will tackle all the Polish names. Resolved to appoint Roman Stoilowski to the Board of Ordinance Appeals 2 to a term ending June 30th, 2023. Subject to the appointee meeting the qualifications set forth in Charter Subset 4.03 and taking the oath of office within two weeks. Support. It's been moved and supported. Is there any discussion? No, thank With you. No discussion. Ms. Riska, can we please have a roll call vote? Mrs. Yarko? Yes. Mrs. Koski? Yes. Mr. Radke? Yes. Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. Mrs. Sorowski? Yes. Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mr. Yanez. Yes. Motion carries. Next is Steve Yukic to a term ending June 30th, 2021. Council. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Radke. 
Resolved to appoint Steve Weekai to the Board of Ordinance Appeals 2 to a partial term ending June 30th, 2021, to the meeting the qualifications set forth in Charter Subsection 4.03 and taking the oath of office within two weeks. Support. Support. It's been moved and supported. Any discussion? With no discussion, Ms. Riska, can we please have a roll call vote? Mrs. Kasky? Yes. Mr. Radke? Yes. Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. Ms. Horaski? Yes. Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mr. Yanez? Yes. Mrs. Yerko? Yes. Motion carries. Next is Ben Ancona to a term ending June 30th, 2022. Council? Mayor Taylor? Mrs. Zerko? Resolved to appoint Ben Ancona to the Board of Ordinance Appeals 2 to a partial term ending June 30th, 2022 subject to the appointee meeting the qualifications set forth in Charter 4.03 and taking the oath of office within two weeks. Support. It's been moved and supported. Is there any discussion? With no discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> it was gonna happen. Too easy, too ah, easy. You tried, Maria. We, we, we saw we slipped one right by him, didn't we? Yep. <laughs> all right. Let's, you know, I don't know why we can't. Next too. meeting. <laughs> All right. Uh, Miss, Miss Riska, roll call vote, please. <laughs> tricky, tricky. Mr. Reiki? Yes. Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. Mrs. Karaski? Yes. Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mr. Yanez? Yes. Mrs. Yerko? Yes. Mrs. Kasky? Yes. Motion carries. Next is the Board of Review. This is a uh, board with two members nominated for appointment, uh, John Fenn and Raymond Nadalski to terms ending June 30th, 2023. We'll take both of these at the same time, Council. Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Schmidt. Resolved to appoint John Fenn and Raymond Nadalski to the Board of Review to terms ending June 30th, 2023 subject to the appointees meeting the qualifications set forth in Charter 4.03 and taking the oath of office within two weeks. Support. It's been moved and supported. Ms. Riska, can, uh, any discussion council? Not Ms. Riska, can we please have a roll call vote? Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. Mrs. Saraski? Yes. Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mr. Yanis? Yes. Mrs. Yarko? Yes. Mrs. Kosky? Yes. And Mr. Radke. Yes. Motion carries. Next is the pension board for the police and fire. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Yes, this is a one member, John Lamarado, Mr. Yanez. Resolved to appoint John Lamarado to the pension board, police and fire to a term ending June 30th, 2022 subject to the appointees meeting the qualifications set forth in, in charter section 4.03 and taking the oath of office within two weeks. Support. Support. It's been moved and supported. Is there any discussion? With no discussion, Ms. Riska, can we please have a roll call vote? Mrs. Saraski? Yes. Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mr. Yanez? Yes. Mrs. Yarko? Yes. Mrs. Kasky? Yes. Mr. Radke? Yes. And Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. Motion carries. Next is the Zoning Board of Appeals. This is one vacancy. Uh, Devin Kosky to a term ending June 30th, 2023. Council? Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Zarko? Yes, through the chair to Mr. Kashupski. Um, for this particular uh, appointment, do I have to add the clause in the best interest of the city? Yes, you do. Okay. Resolved to uh, uh, resolved in the best interest of the city to appoint Devin Kosky to the Zoning Board of Appeals to a term ending June 30th, 2023, subject to the appointee meeting the qualification set forth in Charter 4.03 and taking the oath of office within two weeks. Support. It's been moved and supported. Any discussion, Council? With no discussion, Ms. Riska, can we please have a roll call vote? 
Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mr. Yanez? Yes. Mrs. Yarko? Yes. Mrs. Kasky? Yes. Mr. Radke? No. Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. And Mrs. Sarasky? Yes. Motion carries six to one. Next uh, is the one step process uh, boards and commissions. There's two here that are mayoral appointments. The first is the, the corridor improvement authority. And I'll tell you, I had a, um, so I have two appointments here, local development finance authority and corridor improvement authority. LDFA we're gonna have to pass on because it was determined that my appointment it's not really my appointment based on the structure of this board. There are other uh, jurisdictions, Warren Consolidated Schools in particular, that has an appointment. And this opening uh, needs to be appointed by the Warren Consolidated School District. I have a appointee for LDFA that I would like to have the opportunity to talk to her to see if she would like to serve on the Corridor Improvement Authority instead. So what I, what I would like is um, to pass on a corridor improvement authority and with the idea being that we will postpone that at the end of the, at the end of this uh, agenda item. On LDFA, uh, Mr. Kashupski, any guidance here? Do we, do we postpone this as well? Do we pass on it or do we just take no action? Could we table it? Do it. Mr. Kashubsky. Council would, uh, this, is, this is probably improperly put on the agenda for purposes of this appointment. So taking no action, the, uh, the position would remain open for Warren Consolidated Schools to appoint uh, their um, appointment. And as such, uh, if you tabled it, which is something that Councilman Racky has, uh, has uh, offered, that would also kill this particular motion, uh, which would be appropriate as well. So either one. Okay, would we, if we move to table it, would it be, would somebody uh, move to table support and then on like any other motion, Mr. Kashubsky? Yes. Okay, I'd entertain a motion to table the appointment to the LDFA. So moved. Support. support. It's been moved and supported. Ms. Riska, can we have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Yanez? Yes. Mrs. Yarko? Mrs. Zarko, you're on mute. Yes. Mrs. Kasky? Yes. Mr. Racky? Yes. Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. Mrs. Rasky? Yes. And Mayor Taylor? Yes. Motion carries. Next is the Beautification Commission. Two openings, uh, but to separate uh, term ending dates. Is there anyone that has an appointment council to the Beautification Commission? If not, we'll pass on Beautification Commission for now. Uh, next is the Solid Waste Management Commission, one opening to a term ending June 30th, 2022. Is there anyone with an appointment to the Solid Waste Management Commission? Not we'll pass on that. And then the Youth Advisory Board, there are multiple openings. Does anybody have an appointment to the Youth Advisory Board? Seeing none. Uh, that would mean all of these need to be postponed. I'm looking at the calendar. So the July 7th meeting is, it does give us three weeks, but that's coming out of the 4th of July holiday. Um, I, would, I would entertain a motion to postpone the appointments to the Corridor Improvement Authority, Beautification Commission, Solid Waste Management Commission, and Youth Advisory Board to the Tuesday, July 21st, 2020 City Council meeting. So moved. Support. It's been moved and supported. With no discussion, Ms. Riska, can we please have a roll call vote? Mrs. Zierko? Yes. Mrs. Kasky? Yes. Mr. Radke? Yes. Mrs. Schmidt? 
Yes. Mrs. Saraski? Yes. Mayor Taylor? Yes. And Mr. Yanez? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Uh, thank you, Council. Next item on our agenda tonight is communications from citizens. And as we noted, uh, we are receiving communications from citizens via teleconferencing tonight. All members of the public will continue to be muted until called upon. Those remaining on the call now that wish to participate in communications from citizens will be recognized in turn and asked whether they have a comment. If you wish to participate in this portion of the meeting, please press star nine, which will notify me that your hand is raised and that you desire to speak. A reminder, uh, during this portion of the meeting, you are entitled to speak on any item on tonight's agenda other than the budget, although the budget encompasses pretty much everything we do, so we can let that slide, I suppose. Uh, so at really any topic germane to city business, whether it was on the agenda tonight or not, is pretty much fair game. When prompted, uh, state your name and I will allow you to address city council. Please be advised that there could be uh, delays based on the number of calls that we have received. Looking at our uh, roster of calls, it looks like we only have one. Your hand is raised. So with that, we are going to allow for four minutes uh, to address the city council pursuant to the council's rules. So the caller with the uh, last four digits, 7640, I am going to unmute you. Please announce yourself and you have four minutes for communications from citizens. Thank you. Hello, Mayor Taylor. This is Charles, last name Jefferson. Uh, Mayor Taylor, we got a problem we have to discuss and that's with uh, Planning Commissioner Jeff Garapi. As you know, he in the past has posted offensive pictures of people uh, he has posted offensive uh, uh, writings against uh, people. And the thing is, if you folks are going to preach diversity, if you're going to march in marches, that we need to start a new. He needs to be dealt with tonight. He needs to be removed from the planning commission and the citizen certified certified uh, um, response team, he needs to, uh, since we got people all over the country removing statues, removing names of, of, of buildings that people have uh, been offended by, tearing down our statues. We have a person up at Shelby who did the same thing, and they're trying to remove him tonight. There's no need for us not to revisit this and have him removed at tonight's meeting. Uh, it makes no sense to me. It never made sense to me. That was offensive then and it's offensive now. Even though it's not the classic white to black, it is still offensive to our Chaldean neighbors and our Chaldean friends. No way should that just be looked upon as a joke. As we know, we've had some people like Jeff Novro vehemently put down because of his uh, pictures of, on his Facebook page that he said he was joking to his friends. There's no difference between this and what Jeff Novro, I mean, what Jeff Garrity has done. So please do not march with us and say that you want to have a diverse community don't ask for a diverse community when you guys aren't willing to step up and take the lead and, and do something about it right here in our own community. Um, thank you and have a good night. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Jefferson. Appreciate your comments tonight. I'm gonna to place you back on mute. That is uh, it in terms of participation from citizens because nobody else is on the line. So we'll move on uh, from that portion of our agenda to reports from city administration. Mr. Vanderpool, any items tonight? Nothing further, Mayor, thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Vanderpool. Mr. Kaszubski, any uh, items tonight? Nothing tonight, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Kaszubski. Council, I'll open it up for any uh, unfinished business, uh, reports, new business. Mr. Mayor. Zarko. Hi, uh, May, uh, yes, Mayor Charles, thank you. 
Um, <clears throat> I'm actually looking forward to seeing everybody at our next council meeting in July in person because it's been a, it's been a long time. Um, but this has definitely worked. I, I'm uh, was very comfortable with being able to meet in this forum so that, that we could um, involve our, our residents and the community and update them on a regular basis as to what we were doing during this crisis. And I certainly appreciate all that administration has done. Um, I, and I can't tell you how pleased I am knowing that we were ahead of the game on this. And, and um, certainly we can look back and say that in saving money in the past, we've had the money to, that we needed right now in order to get through this crisis. Um, and I know that everybody's excited about going into their favorite restaurants or their, um, some of the service um, industry, whether it be getting your um, hair done, your nails done. Um, but I would hope, and I, I'm gonna plead with residents to please be respectful of the guidelines each one of these businesses has set in place for their establishment. It's not just for um, your safety, it's for the safety of the people that work for them. And as we like to say, I wear a mask for you and you wear a mask for me. So let's be respectful. And um, I hope soon that we will be in a position that um, we'll be able to give the, uh, each other hugs and um, and get through this. So, um, but if, as long as we start, you know, taking care of ourselves and t and thinking about taking care of others, we'll get there sooner. So, um, nothing further. Thank you, Ms. Sarko. Council, anyone else, Mr. Radke? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a lot of things that are kind of adding up here. Um, I just wanted to say. Uh, I was so happy to see the Supreme Court this week ruled something that I think this council knew for years and most residents in Sterling Heights knew, which is that uh, discriminating, so, discriminating with so, on someone or discriminating against someone because of who they love or how they live their life is unconstitutional. Literally, that was the first meeting I attended to the Sterling Heights City Council when uh, there were efforts to repeal that ordinance. You know, my best friend is gay. And he did not feel like Sterling Heights was a welcoming place once that ordinance was repealed. And I'm glad that we were ahead of the curve then. And we've always stood firm in the belief that people who they love shouldn't matter. And I wanted to just thank the Supreme Court for doing what we all knew then, which was that discriminating against people based upon who they love was wrong. On top of that, I was proud this last week to march on Hall Road uh, with uh, a bunch of protesters who were protesting uh, racism and police brutality. You know, black lives do matter. And I was proud to, to be there with so many thousands of others, a completely peaceful protest. You know, we, we marched, we chanted, everybody wore a mask. It was, it was one of the, just one of the most wonderful moments, I think, in Sterling Heights history, which everyone was peaceful. And it was so large and just everyone was so involved. So I wanted to say that in the spirit of that, I know that we're considering the use of body cameras uh, coming up, but through the chair of Mr. Vanderpool, I'd also hope that you might consider bringing back to the table uh, the diversity coordinator position that uh, was previously budgeted, but which we had to cut this year because of the COVID-19 pandemic. I think they kind of go hand in hand. We must have diversity throughout our organization as well as uh, body cameras for our police. I, I would fully support that. Um, on top of that, I'm, I think it's been wonderful how we've, we've worked together over Zoom. It really has been uh, a lot of work. We get updates, it's, people at home don't see it. We get updates twice a week from the council, uh, from the, the administration, excuse me. And I think it's just wonderful. It, it's been amazing to work together to get through this. We're not done yet, but I, I'm just so proud with how the city has done. And with that, that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Radke. Council, anyone else? Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Sorowski. Thank you, Mayor Taylor. Well, first and foremost, I wanna congratulate Mrs. Riska for being number one in the state. That is an honor that very, very few people get and you are certainly deserving of it. So congratulations. And we thank you and applaud you for all your hard efforts and all the good you do for our citizens. And um, so again, wonderful job. Um, number two, I am really very impressed that we have the Parks and Recs has uh, made 4,000 signatures for, to the senior calls because 
One thing that I've learned, especially with this COVID-19 and our patients that we were not able to see, we called them instead of making visits when we couldn't get out to see them because they wouldn't allow us. We called them three or four times a week. That alone kept them out of the hospital, made sure that they had what they needed. We still coordinated things for them. And I know that's exactly what our citizens were doing as well for the seniors. So those calls are extremely important to um, make contact with people that aren't get able to get out on a good day, let alone with the pandemic. So kudos to our um, Department of Parks and Rec for doing all that. And then uh, thirdly and finally, I do want to really applaud the city for going forward, looking at the diversity, looking at what we lack and what we need to improve on in our diversity of our city and, and putting forth the African-American coalition. It is a wonderful start and it's a, an important start. And I know I've said this before, but my grandmother is the daughter of freed slaves who were children when they were freed. She didn't, she was from the South and moved up to Detroit and told no one. She told no one in her immediate family except her husband and her children. She told no neighbors who, what her heritage was. She lived in hiding. And she could do that because she was fair skinned and blue eyed, but she still had that ability and to, to have to do that. I can't even imagine when she when she told me in her 90s what our, our heritage was. It was a shock, you know, surprise. And then her next statement was, "Don't tell anybody else." That made me that made me so sad. And I'm so so proud that we are able to at least reach out to people who have had. I got. I was. I had, I had the benefit of not having to grow up. Um, with my heritage and my skin making the difference. My skin was light enough that people didn't know. And I didn't know until I was an adult. Skin color should not matter and to, in any stance and to be able to start really, really making a challenge to those that it makes a difference to and to help change their minds. I am proud of the city for doing that. I'm 100% behind this. I am always willing to look at ways to increase diversity and inclusion. So again, I'm very proud of this and I think we're finally, we're getting in the right direction. We're in the right direction, but we're getting better at going further. So thank you. Mayor thank Taylor. Thank you, Mrs. Rowski. Mrs. Schmidt. Thank you. Um, I as well would like to congratulate Ms. Riska. Uh, you have done a phenomenal job. You make um, getting a hold of the clerk's office uh, a pleasant uh, situation. Your staff is on the ball and, and very organized and that's a true sign of a good leader. Um, as far as the protests that have been going on in our community, I'm very proud to say that they've all remained very peaceful and grateful that they re remain very peaceful. I'd like to thank our police department for really um, embracing those protests and those protesters. And um, I, I believe uh, fostering relationships with that whole situation has really helped um, our community as a whole and everything that our police department does outreach wise, um, I can't say enough about it. So I know we, we do have work to do and I think everyone's on board for getting that done. And I look forward to uh, what we have in the future. So um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schmidt. Council, anyone else? Mrs. Koski. I also would like to congratulate Ms. Roska. You are a clerk of the year. I think we should put a big picture of you in the summer or fall magazine, Sterling Heights magazine, so everyone in the whole community will know how great you are. We really appreciate everything that you do. And we're probably going to give you lots of work to do this fall. So keep up the good work and congratulations again. Thank you, Ms. Koski. Council, anyone else? If not, okay, I'll just uh, briefly make some comments. I don't know if uh, if I'm flickering to everybody else, like I am on my screen, I feel like the picture on Back to the Future, but um, you know, this, this last, since this last city council meeting, there have been uh, some remarkable things going on in the world, some terrible things going on in the world. And 
we have three incredible, I shouldn't say incredible, but just three events converging at the same time in a way that I don't think anyone would have ever predicted. The public health crisis, the economic crisis, and the civic unrest that uh, rightly is uh, bubbling over after uh, years, decades, and centuries of inequality and injustice. I'm proud of the city's response uh, tonight, and I look forward to being a part of the solution. And anyone watching this that does not believe that Sterling Heights is doing enough, I sincerely can speak on behalf of our entire city council and our administration that we desperately want to hear from you and we want you to be brutally honest with us. If there is anything that we can do that we're not doing, please tell us. Don't be afraid to, to email us, to call us, to reach out to us on social media. If you don't want to serve, but you want your voice to be heard, all of us will listen to you. We are here to make this community better for everyone who lives here. Uh, our main objective here is to improve the human experience of every resident who lives in Sterling Heights. We strive to have a higher quality of life for all of our residents, and we will continue to do so. And uh, particularly to those uh, in communities who have been marginalized and whose voices haven't been heard, we wanna hear from you the most. So um, this is a tremendous moment in the American uh, democracy and in the American story. And it's a chapter that's still being written and. Uh, we are uh, incredibly proud as uh, leaders of this city to uh, answer the call. I know each one of us stands ready to do anything we can. So um, it is. I don't want this to just seem like hollow words to you. It truly is heartfelt. And I know that each one of us uh, means it. So uh, we look forward to working with our community and our neighbors to make this city an even greater place with that, Council, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Support. Support. So moved and supported. Ms. Riska, can we please have a roll call vote? Mrs. Kosky? Yes. Mr. Radke? Yes. Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. Mr. Swarovski? Yes. Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mr. Yanez? Yes. And Mrs. Yarko? Yes. Motion carries 7-0. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you uh, for participating. See you in two weeks.